Uh, so welcome to this talk on uh, request smuggling. Uh, my name is Philippe Arpeau. Uh, thank you for the great presentation, Max. So uh, I have uh, one slide less to do. So, yeah. So, um, so who am I? I'm a security researcher, as Max said, uh, at GoSecur. I focus mainly on application security. Uh, so if you have a question about any of the, those projects, uh, you can poke me uh, afterward. So the topic of today is HTTP request smuggling, or I've shortened it to request smuggling. Um, the way I've divided this talk, first, we're going to start with an introduction to a key concept needed to understand uh, request smuggling. So uh, mainly HTTP tunneling introduced by HTTP 1.1. Um, there have been some new variants recently, but I'm going to focus on the various techniques related to uh, HTTP 1.1 specifically. Uh, I'm going to do an overview of the different uh, attack and risk associated to uh, request smuggling, so mainly cache poisoning, uh, credential hijacking or connection hijacking, uh, URL filtering bypass, and XSS. At the end, I'm going to present uh, what are the mitigation depending on what uh, appliance you have installed. Uh, this will apply both to a cloud provider and uh, if you have on-premise in uh, infrastructure, and uh, also a key takeaway uh, to summarize everything. So uh, this presentation doesn't bring new exploit or new CV specifically. What I've tried to do is uh, an introduction to request smuggling and summarize these three main presentations. So uh, first, in 2005, uh, there's this company, uh, Watchfire, that introduced the concept of uh, request smuggling. Uh, already in 2005, uh, all the risks that I'm going to present, almost, um, the cache poisoning, the XSS, um, and the connection hijacking were already present in this paper. What happened in 2016 is uh, this French researcher, uh, Régis Leroy, presented uh, at DEF CON with variant of this same attack uh, using a different header called transfer encoding. We're going to see later how uh, it's working. But what really put uh, request smuggling on the map is the presentation from James Kittle um, in 2019, introducing, again, small new variant, but uh, mainly presenting some actual case of a uh, uh, high-profile website. So we're going to see a few examples uh, in this presentation. And at this point in 2019, it became really a popular um, vulnerability, and people become uh, more aware of it. Uh, uh, in 2016, the proof concept were um, not as convincing, I would say, but still the, all the, the paper were detailing all the, the, the detail of the exploit. So to understand request smuggling, we need to um, understand HTTP tunneling. HTTP tunneling is a concept of HTTP 1.1. So uh, we can see a main difference between HTTP uh, 1.0 and 1.1 is that initially HTTP was one request equal one TCP connection. Uh, this is not uh, best for performance because there's a lot of handshake involved every time you do a request. And for a simple plain HTML web page, it could make sense. It's lightweight, uh, uh, not lightweight, but simple to implement. The thing is, as soon as you have a couple of image, style sheet, uh, JavaScript file that are referred by this page, suddenly you have a ton of TCP connection required just to load one page. Uh, in 1.1, a uh, persistent connection were introduced. Uh, with this concept, we're going to be able to put in the same pipeline, so HTTP pipeline, uh, multiple requests uh, in a continuous manner. Uh, it also introduced a uh, transfer encoding header that will be, uh, be used in some variant later. So visually, how does it look, uh, HTTP pipelining? So HTTP pipelining is used uh, by client, but HTTP client include both browser and backend server that communicate with other backend server. So a proxy uh, would uh, do HTTP pipelining because in the end, they don't want to create a ton of sockets for um, every client, and they want to reuse connection to uh, reduce the, the number of TCP and shake, uh, as one example. Uh, 
So if one client sends two requests, we can see here that the re uh, requests are in place first in the this, uh, socket connection. If we have another client that, that sends to other connection, they're going to be placed potentially in the same connection pool or connection, I should say. So here there's it's a pool of only one connection. So in the same socket, we have four requests from two different clients. Another reason they are doing um, uh, HTTP pipelining is that we don't have to uh, wait for the response to send another request. We can send all the requests all at once and uh, parse the response as they come. So that's uh, HTTP pipelining. Now, if we look inside of the socket uh, at multiple uh, requests in one connection, we can see I have a few requests here, three requests. And if I am adding some color, we can see that there are three, three requests. But how does the proxy or the web server knows where each request ends? Uh, because this is really important. We have multiple clients and multiple uh, requests per client. So we need to know where everything ends in a, in a precise uh, manner. So I've added some color, but um, server are not guessing. They need some uh, clear spec. So what they will use here is content length. Content length header is pretty simple. So with content length zero, this means that after header, we're going to have two uh, new lines. So slash r slash n two times. And then it's going to be the, the content of the post body, uh, the body of the request. Here in this, this case, it's zero. So right away, we're continuing to the next request. The second request is a post request where there, there is a content length that is not zero. Uh, because it has multiple uh, parameter in post. So uh, here it's simple, content length uh, is read, and this way we know where every request ends. Um, request smuggling is going to take effect uh, if we have an infrastructure where there is a proxy, uh, either proxy that we have put in place, so our own uh, uh, web cache, uh, maybe uh, something that has a firewall feature or a web proxy, but it could also be a cloud provider, maybe a Cloudflare, uh, Fastly, etc., that is in between uh, the client, so the browser and our web server. And request smuggling in a nutshell is when the proxy looking at the connection will interpret one request, while the backend for the same series of bytes will see two requests. And the reason for that is that the parser will have some small differences that the uh, attacker will try to capitalize on. So let's see a first attack. So this is a, a proof of concept that is taken from the first paper. So the, the paper from uh, 2005 from Watchfire. Uh, I've taken uh, this example uh, because it's uh, really simple to understand. But uh, keep in mind that this will not work in modern uh, system because, for example, Nginx and uh, Apache will simply block um, requests, any request that has multiple content length. But 2005, the paper, uh, all the, the payload were focusing on a double content length header uh, in one request. So here on the uh, left, we're going to see what the proxy see and the um, on the right, what the server will interpret. And so it's the same communication. It's not a two, two, uh, two box, two requests. It, this is the same communication. And the reason the proxy and the, the backend will not uh, interpret it the same way is that when they parse the request, it's a bit like uh, parsing JSON. You're going to parse multiple properties. And if you have to store those values in a hash map, for example, um, if you have a value that are unique per key, uh, once you're going to um, encounter a duplicate, you can either choose to override the existing value or simply ignore the following one. So in the case, in this case, the first, the, the proxy, also on the left, uh, will simply always override with the last header. So here it's, uh, it's going to keep the value 37 for the content length, while the backend, the web server here, is keeping the first one and uh, will never override this volume. So you can add a 10 header of content length. It will keep the first one, which is zero. 
So what this introduced, uh, it introduced uh, a problem where we are reading two different content lands, so they don't agree where the first request end. So in the case, the first uh, first case is going to be between blah and get test, while the first the second one is going to um, be ending right before the get profile. So what the, what is the effect? So um, the first scenario that they are presenting in the paper from 2005, out of, of uh, four or five risk, is cache poisoning. Because on the left, the proxy will think that we're requesting to index and then test page, while the backend is answering to the path index and profile slash 137. So, what is going to happen if our proxy is also having a feature uh, of caching is that uh, the first page will be returned as expected. So the response will match what was requested. But for the second page, uh, we're actually returning user data, uh, the, so par uh, partly profile information from the user uh, ID 1337. And the content of this JSON will be overriding the test.html. So uh, this is problematic because uh, the attacker will send this malicious request, but every user that will request uh, test the HTML afterward will be uh, using this poison resources. So some of the other risks that are presented in this uh, first paper already in uh, 2005, uh, cache poisoning, as, as we saw, uh, capability to bypass real filtering. So if we have authentication or uh, path that are blacklist by the proxy, so think about a path that might be administrative uh, console, maybe monitoring console, or any management uh, page that one uh, needed to be blacklist, um, these could be bypassed. Um, credential hijacking or connection hijacking uh, is going to be uh, when uh, we are going to do a second request that is incomplete and is going to grab the following request or a request from another user. And uh, we're going to try to, to uh, uh, get some value reflected. So we're going to send an example in a moment. Persistent XSS, I put it in code. Uh, we're going to be able to force uh, HTML or JavaScript to, uh, to a user that are visiting the, the website without special interaction. So all they need to do is visit the website and they are going to be uh, uh, receive an XSS. So th there's going to be a demo at the end of the presentation. So an open redirect is a very similar uh, cases to the XSS. So I'm going to present example, but here this time with a more modern uh, technique. So the technique that was uh, presented with uh, the talk at DEF CON by uh, Regis uh, Leroy is using transfer encoding chunk. So transfer encoding chunk is a feature from HTTP 1.1 that uh, aim to uh, allow server to response, uh, provide some huge response. So think about uh, maybe a, a large XML file that is maybe generated on the fly. And maybe you don't know the, the length of this response ahead of time. So instead of computing everything in memory, know the, the size and send the, the response, you can with uh, Transfer encoding chunk, send uh, each of part of your file um, one chunk at a time. So here, I have a file that I'm generating on the fly. So the way it's going to work, where first the first line is always the size in hexadecimal of the following line. So then you can pass any uh, binary or ASCII uh, value. Then the second part is eight character long. So we have north sec, um, and then conference is. 11, uh, 11 uh, the, the length of the, this chunk. So we're passing B. Uh, yeah. And the last part is always 0, just uh, to acknowledge the browser. We're done with sending the response. Uh, this is completed. So here we, we have no content length description of all the requests at once. Uh, why this uh, feature is useful is that while it might be uh, aimed at uh, server response, it can also be used in a request. So if I'm requesting uh, the index page from myapp.com, 
I can also include the post body in a chunk format. And that's where, what we're going to abuse. So uh, it can be abused because content length and transfer encoding are kind of um, colliding because they serve the same feature. They are describing the length of the body of a post request. So when this was introduced, uh, an RFC uh, specified what you should you do if the client is sending both content length and transfer encoding. Uh, the answer to this is the RFC say, says, when there is transfer encoding, you should use this uh, header, so you should ignore content length at all. Uh, so there should be a priority in transfer encoding. Uh, but the way transfer encoding is parsed, this header might differ from one infrastructure to another. So one server from one server to another. Uh, an example of this is uh, here with uh, where the, the, the backend here is going to parse a transfer encoding header while there's not an invalid header separation. So as you, you might know, every header in an HTTP request should be separated by slash r slash n. No matter what, uh, this is not a Windows or Linux thing. Every request, uh, no matter uh, the platform, should always be slash r slash n. But this specific backend uh, was parsing header uh, uh, with new line that are just slash n, so not the new line. So for this reason, the, uh, the, the proxies is uh, parsing the request as the spec and only look, uh, seeing content length. It's not seeing transfer encoding at all in the first request. But if we, we do the, the same communication, our backend is parsing it differently, so uh, switching in chunk mode. And for this reason, the zero uh, that is initially placed will be interpreted as we have a chunk that will follow of zero, so ending the request, and then we have another one that is starting. So what is happening is we have a, a request that is not yet completed, that is still in the pipeline, so we're going to receive a response for the first part in blue. But the next user that will send a request, uh, its request will be uh, basically glued to the, the previous one that we have started. So we are forcing the request update profile to the user. So all its cookie and all the headers from the, the, its request will be happened to this request. So that's what we are seeing uh, visually in orange. So this is called connection hijacking. Um, a few other alternatives to this that were found uh, by in the talk from uh, James Kiddo. So that's uh, his main focus for his 2019 uh, talk is that he found tons of variation in actual software. So either if you place a non-printable character between the column and chunk, <clears throat> uh, hey, as you can see, there, there are a ton of uh, variation and the Burr plugin that, that was released uh, to support the, this testing has numerous uh, variation of this. So uh, if you're reading the paper from uh, James Kittle, you will see that we are they are often referring with uh, some uh, short name and that, that I'll be using later also in this presentation. The prefix is always what the proxy is seeing and the second part is what the backend is seeing. So that's it for this. Um, so yeah, the, sometimes the, the the proxy will, will look at content land, but sometimes it will interpret uh, transfer encoding. So this is not a, a one side. Sometimes it can be reversed. An example of connection hijacking, so very similar to the one previously where we were uh, forcing the update profile, but with a real case scenario that was found by James Kettle on New Relic platform, and specifically the login server. So the first element that needs to be recognized is that the login email field is reflected in the page. So as soon as there's an incorrect login, so here it's forcing an incorrect password, so there's no chance the login will work. But the email is reflected in the page. So what can we do about this if we have, uh, if we detect that the server is also vulnerable to uh, HTTP request smuggling? Here we're going to uh, 
do the technique with transparent coding chunk where the, so it's very similar to the double content length header that we had initially, uh, the, the simple payload from the beginning. But here we're taking advantage of, we're gonna override the transferring encoding header with X. So just to nullify that, that there's even the chunk mode enabled. So the, the proxy doesn't see chunk encoding at all because it's keeping the last header in the case where the, there's our duplicate headers. The second uh, on the left, we can see what the backend is seeing and the backend is, um, here, uh, we're passing, we're starting a new request for the login. So this is the, the request that was reflecting the login email field, but we're not gonna finish the request. So we need to specify a huge content lamp. And basically we're gonna grab the following requests. So uh, basically content from another user. And what uh, James Kittle managed to do is a, a proof concept where he was able to intercept a post request to the login page that was reflected in his uh, form uh, when submitting the request, request on the, the left. So now uh, here's an example of how can we abuse uh, XSS uh, with the same technique. So instead of uh, grabbing the next request here, we're uh, gonna happen something to force an XSS on the, the response of uh, the next user. So the user that has a request next in the HTTP pipeline. So here it's a very simple uh, cases. Um, this, this was found, I think, in a SaaS provider that, that was kept uh, anonymized, but basically it looked like a provider that simply doesn't support chunk encoding. So it's probably a proprietary uh, stack that was made, uh, that was homemade. Uh, here, the, yeah, so the, the backend doesn't support chunk encoding. So for this reason, we're abusing uh, it by making it the content length uh, huge to uh, grab almost everything. I don't know. So the, the first request is using chunk. So for this, the chunk part will grab everything. So we have a 10 and 66 that will grab the actual request or the, the first part of our request that we want to force. While the proxy, uh, not the proxy, the backend will um, we'll see it differently. I'm gonna do a, a demo in a moment uh, with XSS with a simpler case, but here we're injecting it in the body. So the, the response that the second user will see is uh, basically it will, um, so yeah, the, the SAML equal is not the request, the response, but what is sent to the page but because it was reflecting the uh, SAML parameter in the response, uh, here we could exploit uh, the XSS. So why are we doing this? Uh, uh, instead of reflecting XSS, first, there is no interaction needed. And sometimes there are some specific conditions that make the XSS theoretically unexploitable. But because of uh, request smuggling, sometimes we can add either that are uh, required to the exploitation. So we needed a demo. So I'm going to demonstrate uh, request smuggling with a very simple uh, website called Simple Website. So um, this website has a contact form that is interesting because if we look at, uh, if we add some uh, additional parameters that are not there initially, these are reflected here in the page. So we might look for a potential XSS by appending some value, but we can see that everything is encoded. Uh, but the, everything here is encoded by the, um, the browser. And this is some, something that make theoretically this XSS uh, not exploitable. So if I'm sending this to repeater, so it's not really possible unless you're going to old version of IE. So, um, but if we send um, an actual payload that is on escape, so on an encoded uh, here, we will see that it's actually, actually a reflected. Um, I'm actually in the right page. Yes. So we can see here, I'm gonna 
add some character to make it more visual. But we can see that everything here is not escaped. So we're going to take advantage of this, that the fact that we can uh, exploit it uh, this way by crafting our own re request. Uh, so it's going to be a simple request where the proxy will look at the content land header while uh, the backend will support chunk properly and um, we'll see two different requests and the second starting here. We will not see the response for the second request, but any user that will be following our request will see an excess. So I will send this malicious payload. So for what we're receiving uh, here is the response for the first request, so nothing special. But if we're a user navigating on the website, we're not going to see something yet. And this is something you need to be aware with uh, request smuggling, is that um, uh, proxies will often have multiple connection pools, so you might need multiple requests. So here, uh, I'm using HTTP uh, Apache traffic server. And after 10 requests, we can see that a user uh, was hijacked. So I could have been visiting any page. In the end, I received a response for the contact form. So this is the quick demo. Before doing a payload like this, how can you discover uh, such vulnerability? So uh, here I have some quick payload. So there is a plugin and different scanner that will uh, try to detect this. Um, this is a payload that is uh, basically uh, uh, testing both chunk and uh, content at the same time. And what we want to see is if the, the second request is actually uh, using chunk mode, can we happen one character, could be X, could be G, anything, to the next request just to break the method. So the method, the next request should be a post or a get or potentially a, a put. Let's see. So when we send this, uh, we're not going to see something yet, but if we do a lot of requests um, with our payload, at some point, we might receive something like uh, 405 not allowed. 405 stands for uh, meta not allowed. Why, why does it come to this? It's because it's actually doing a G post here because we're repeating a post request. And at some point, uh, our request combined with a previous one. Uh, I remember hearing in one of the presentation by James Kittle that uh, for one exploit, he had to send uh, 800 requests to confirm the vulnerability. So this is a vulnerability that is hard to confirm because in real infrastructure, you're not the only one doing requests. So uh, you need to be patient and have a good idea of what you're trying. So if you can extract, for example, version or some information about what the proxy is being used and what is the backend, uh, you can uh, find around it like this or be more precise. I know the scanner from uh, the Burp plugin is using a timeout technique. And this is not perfect uh, because it will miss a few cases, including the demo I've presented. I've run the scanner and didn't found it, but I'm going to show a quick way, uh, a quick tip to still uh, find the vulnerability if you're using the plugin. Okay, so now how do you defend against uh, this uh, this vulnerability? Uh, the quick, the, the easy answer is just do your updates. So Apache Traffic Server, Nginx, Varnish, HA Proxy all have received uh, fixes. There are some exceptions, like uh, I know Big Fix was mentioned in the presentation where they, they say they have done a fix, but it's actually a net visually where they mention two mitigations, so it's not built in. So uh, if you're having a F5 in your infrastructure, you, there are two methods to mitigate the, the issue. So, uh, and one of the issue is to uh, activate advanced WAF and a specific rule to block uh, request smuggling. So be aware that uh, sometimes they say there's a fix, but actually there is a method for mitigation. So 
uh, in the, the, the case of uh, FR, they have created a new rule. Um, so don't try to uh, modify uh, your own application to mitigate this. Uh, adding a few security headers won't fix this issue. So uh, content, content security policy uh, will not have any effect at preventing these type of accesses because we're controlling all the other uh, parameter and even part of the body. Uh, cloud services have provided some fix, fixes. Um, none of the uh, provider listed here have made a public response of how they have implemented it, but there is the, uh, an RFC uh, 70, 7230 that is um, giving guideline of how you should normalize uh, requests. So when you have both transfer encoding and content length, how can you normalize the, the query to be sure that there's no ambiguity? So they are using it. So this is a screenshot from for detection. So that's one of the best way to uh, be 100% uh, sure. So even if you have done your update, uh, be sure that you're not vulnerable. So it's an extra uh, protection doing some manual tests will be uh, helpful also. But this is the plugin from uh, Burp. Uh, there are, these are all tests that can be done uh, when you, done, uh, you run the request modeling scan. Be aware that some case will not be found because they expect some timeout to be created with some payload. And in uh, multiple cases that I've tested, uh, it didn't found the guarantee that I've introduced. So, but you can uh, find the bounty uh, uh, still using the plugin. So if you have the Flow plugin from Burp, Flow is basically showing you all the requests from Burp. So everything that you see in the proxy, but also requests initiated by a plugin. And you will see uh, here um, requests initiated by a plugin and response that are four or five should be uh, fishy and analyzed because Either this request or one of the previous ones have introduced uh, a glitch that introduced a bad method. So look for a 405 now. This is uh, important. If you're doing manual testing, uh, make sure your client support to disable content length because uh, by default, um, Burp will simply rewrite content length header. So it might be breaking your, your payload without uh, you not, not, not noticing it, so uh, be aware of this. So already uh, at the last slide, so take away, uh, request modeling can, can greatly affect your um, application. We've seen multiple risks and attacks, so uh, this is not only one vector. There are multiple venues uh, if there are some, uh, if you are vulnerable to this, uh, make sure you test your uh, your environment with automated tools and potentially manual testing. There are some new variants that I don't have the time to cover, but uh, recently uh, there have been some variants with uh, WebSocket and HTTP2. So um, while in 2019, um, uh, James Kittle had some new variant with transfer coding, there are some uh, variants that allow uh, specifically uh, bypassing URL RL filtering. So if you have time to, to check those, there are some nice proof of concept uh, available by uh, uh, the company that found the, the vulnerability initially with, for HTTP2. And uh, apparently the talk from this year uh, from James Kittle is gonna be on HTTP2. And most of the, the, the key vulnerabilities are already published from uh, late last year. It was uh, nominated as a top 10 uh, attack of last year. So uh, if you are looking for the slide, there is this short link. And for to reproduce the demonstration I've made, I didn't have time to do the HTTP2 one, but uh, if you're curious, these are in the slides. So uh, the slide should be already available. 